Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, can Idaho's state parks be run more like businesses? That's what the governor has called for, and that's what my guest today is going to try and accomplish. A conversation with Idaho Parks and Recreation Director Nancy Merrill, next on Dialogue. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. A welcome as well to those of you listening on public radio and the World Wide Web. Idaho's parks touch every region of the state, from Priest Lake to Bear Lake. The agency that oversees those assets is the Idaho Department of Parks and Recreation. The legislature authorized the department in 1965 in order to receive a donation of 11,000 acres of pristine land from the Harriman family. The Harrimans gave the land, which is near Yellowstone, on the stipulation that a professional agency manage it and the other parks in Idaho. Since 1907, control of those parks had shifted back and forth between the Department of Lands and the Highway Department. Now recently, it looked as if the agency might cease to exist again, with the governor recommending its functions be folded into the Department of Lands and Fish and Game. In part because of the Harriman bequest, though, that idea was nixed. But Governor Otter has asked the parks director to make her agency self-sufficient. In other words, it would take no funds from the state. Right now, the department has a $38.4 million budget, $6.7 million of which is state dollars. The governor is recommending a $4.5 million drop in general funds. After holdbacks, that leaves a little under $2 million in that category. That's the steepest drop percentage-wise in general funds that any state agency would have to deal with. The plan was in part predicated on closing Dwarshack Park in North Idaho and transferring management to Clearwater County. But on Wednesday, Parks Board members decided not to follow through with that idea. So where will the agency pair costs and how will that affect you? And can parks bring in enough revenue to be self-sufficient? With me to talk about these issues and take your questions is Nancy Merrill, the director of the Idaho Depart Department excuse me, of Parks and Recreation. Welcome. Thank you, Marcia. Now, Governor Otter appointed Ms. Merrill just to her position last September. Prior to taking the job, she was the mayor of Eagle from 2002 to 2007. And if you have questions or comments, you can reach us, as usual, on our toll-free number, 1-800-973-9800. First of all, welcome to you. I know it's been a really, really busy week. I appreciate you being here on Dialogue. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start right off with a question that somebody had, Sharon. She wrote in on our Facebook page. Perfect. We're into social media now. And she wants to know, did you know it would be like this when you took your job? <laughs> Which, as I mentioned, was September. Now, you talked to the Idaho yeah. Environmental Forum in mid-December, and I right. was there. And at that time, you said, oh, I thought I had maybe a couple years to make this transition. And the governor told me I need to do it all this year. So when you were hired, did you know that you were going to have to get the agency off all state funding in one year? You know, I did not know that. I knew that we were in a tough time. I, I think there was no surprise that Idaho was in an economic decline. And that parks, uh, if you look at uh, parks and recreation and health and welfare or schools, wants and needs, we knew that we would have challenges. I knew that coming in. I was ready for it. So you still would have taken the job knowing what I you know would. today? Yep. Well, let's talk about kind of some general philosophy here before mm -hmm. we get into some specifics. Terry wrote in and says, does Ms. Merrill agree fundamentally that parks should be run like a business and should support themselves? Or should that be a function, or should it be a function of government to protect these places for natural and scenic values, recreation, and future generations? So there's a sense that running something like a business might degrade the parks. Do you, do you agree that parks should be run like a business? Marsha, I think there's a twofold. I think that yes, that we need to be more efficient and run like a business and, and look at our costs and expenses and our revenues and our expenditures and be very careful with those taxpayer dollars. But there's also a part of it that says that these parks belong to the state of Idaho and that they are, say, state parks on them and there is a fiduciary responsibility of the state to also help. So I think that there's a combination here and there are no state parks in any of the whole United States that are totally self-sufficient. So we are going to move towards that direction of self-sufficiency the best and do the best that we can and, and run this more like a business, but we will not lose what we are. Well, let's take a listen to your one of your predecessors, mm -hmm. Yvonne Farrell, who was director of the department for, I believe, 15 years. Yes. Let's uh, hear what she thinks. She supports you but has some concerns. 
I have a, a great deal of concern about that because, um, to my knowledge, it hasn't worked any place else in the United States. And when you have to focus exclusively on making money, there are a lot of aspects and qualities in a state park that um, become non become not relevant. So other like historic properties and uh, conservation protection of the stewardship issues, I think often suffer because you have to make maximize the income at at the cost of everything else. Is that a concern of yours too? Let's just take Yankee Fork, which is a historical park, day use, no RVs come and staying, paying uh, camp fees. Is it a concern of yours as it is hers that historical parks and other conservation values might go away without state funding? Absolutely. I think that's an extremely good example of that. And uh, Yvonne says it very well. Uh, and Yankee Fork is a good example of that in the mining town of Chalice. Uh, without camping, any of our parks that don't have camping don't have the ability to raise the revenue, but they're just as important as any other park in the state of Idaho. And you have some news about Yankee Fork you were telling me, maybe. Well, yes, I would say that uh, all of our staff has worked very hard to try to help us get more self-sustaining, to bring in more revenue, to help pay, if you will, for, so we can pay our way. Uh, one of our staff members just today told me that they're applying for a $75,000 grant from the Forest Service to help pay for employees to keep that open. Now the other parks, some other parks do actually do quite well. I think three or four of them maybe even make money, the ones where there is a lot of RV camping. Um, what we've seen though is your budget is predicated in part on the RV users giving up about half of the current funds that are in the pool that they've collected so far from their additional sticker registration fee. And let's take a listen to one of your RV representatives talk about that and some reaction from the board the other day. I don't like that idea, but in order for us to save the parks, we had to do something. It's a give and take situation here. If we don't give something, we're not gonna be able to have some things and we'll take back later on okay so Miss Merrill I'm expecting you to hang tough with us and get our two million dollar back in a couple of years by taking us the money from the RV group a half of their money two million dollars we we don't have the money to build more campgrounds because we've taken we were shooting the goose that lays the golden egg and we really shouldn't do that first to Mr. Romali's question Romali I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong Will they eventually get their money back, do you think? I mean, they're fronting you quite a bit of money here to help keep staff. Uh, that is a, uh, an agreement that we made, and we promise that we will get it back to them. Uh, what we will do is this is a bridge to get us from one year to the next two but to five years. it's a verbal years. agreement. It's, it's not a, in writing. <laughs> it is a, a verbal agreement, and if we need it in writing, we'll put it in writing for them. Uh, but um, these RV users have been great advocates, and, and uh, we intend to do the same. And to board member Lombard's concern that, you know, basically that money was to go expand certain uh, areas, campgrounds, RV pads. And if you're now in a revenue generating situation, it's supposed to operate more like a business, to take that money away and not be able to grow is his concern. Yeah, we've, there is some concern about that. However, if we look over the last five years, we've put uh, millions of dollars into RV improvements. And now we're going to take some of that money and we're going to maintain what we have already invested in for the next few years until we can build that back up again to go back and rebuild. Remembering that though we will not be stopping grants or building projects because other entities that apply for them will still have that money. So half that money will still be building projects on the ground, just maybe not in our state parks. Let's talk about <coughs> fees in general. You've raised fees once already this fiscal year by a little bit, um, and you're, pr you're proposing to raise fees again. We can't go through the whole fee structure, it's very complicated. But in general, the most popular parks where you see the most use, you're, you're proposing to raise fees more. Um, what's the, the price point at which you price out you know, the average citizen and you kind of shoot yourself in the foot because people aren't gonna go to the park? 
where is that diminishing return? Uh, you know, our the, one of the things we're really concerned about is not outpricing our families and to be able to go to any of our state parks. And so as we've looked around at our fees, we look at other states to see where we are. We're right even with the other states that are out there, and we believe that where we have priced out here, people can still come to parks and have, it will still be a good bargain. And I still like to go back to the idea of if you take a family of four to a movie and you spend uh, four, t four tickets and a tub of popcorn and two drinks, you're going to spend $49.50. You can go to a park and spend all day for $5. Or you can camp for two nights for less than the, what you're buying for two hours or three hours at a movie theater. Director Merrill, what about this idea of maybe tacking on a $5 registration fee to people's cars when they register? Washington State has done this, Montana. Uh, is this idea getting, gaining traction in the legislature where everybody would basically pay? And then Idahoans would not have to buy an additional or pay the kiosk every time they came in. Right, and that is, that is one of the ideas that Montana is doing, and it is an opting in or opting out. Uh, fee that they pay at the time of registration and in lieu of that then you do not have day passes or annual passes and so where our annual passes cost forty dollars and a day pass costs five dollars every time you go in for a five dollar registration fee annually you'd be able to go to any of the parks and anytime. Do you have a sponsor for that? We are just we're just now investigating it. Okay, we have another question from Tim here. What does it mean when you talk about supporting themselves independently? Does that mean that every park must support itself or are the more profitable parks going to support the other ones like Yankee Fork? Well, I think, Marcia, if we're going to run it like a business, we'll look at the whole system. And those that have the ability to raise the funds and are, have the RVs and the camping on that, or that are more self-sufficient, will indeed be able to help the other parks that are not. And uh, we'll, we'll run it that way. Uh, I want to ask you another thing that your budget was predicated on was closing Door Shack mm -hmm. Park. And in fact, it is closed. I mean, the employees aren't there anymore and their positions are vacant. And um, let's listen to some uh, testimony from a Clearwater County Commissioner and uh, somebody in the legislature and the board about this sure. issue and, and we'll talk about what happened. We had two and a half or three months to make this thing work and zero fund balance and no money to put into it. We had to be in the black the first year and no option other than that. That's a pretty hard thing to dive into when you have a county that struggles like ours does. What does closing a state park mean? It, 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 there is no other interpretation, I think, other than we have too many parks. And I do not believe that is the sentiment of the citizens of the state of Idaho and I don't believe that's an, uh, that's an appropriate uh, uh, reaction by a state government to a crisis. This may just not be the right thing to do to force a county to a position where they have to make a decision because they have no choice, but to make a decision they really don't have the resources or the background to try to, to make a success of it. Okay, let's first talk about what happened. The board decided that the department, your agency, should go back to the drawing board, find ways to keep Dorshack and the other parks open. Your budget was predicated on this and, and other things like Thousand, Thousand Springs and potentially Yankee Fork closing. What are you going to do now? Well, Marsha, we are going to do what we always do. We're going to put the pencils to the paper and we're going to find ways to keep these parks open. The board has uh, made the decision and the staff is going to go to work well, and seriously, see what, what we can do. Seriously, what would it mean? It could mean well, letting what, people go from other parks though, right? What we'll have to do is, is uh, like in any business, you have to look at where your assets are and what you're going to have to do and, and it will definitely lower service, our levels of service. What does that mean? Well today when we um, clean restrooms, we clean them three times a day and shower so they clean and that's one of the things people like to come to the parks for. Uh, because of the clean facilities. Without the people to run those parks, which are our rangers, we, they can't possibly do it. So that would mean less, less services, clean, less cleanliness in our restrooms, for example. That's just one of the examples. So when you say lower service, if you spread it out, that's what it will happen. But these were big numbers. I mean, you were predicating some bigger figures coming out of this right. than just, you know, cleaning bathrooms. One of your employees actually stood up and said, you know, the math just doesn't add up on this. And, you know, every time you propose a park to be closed, you're going to have a constituency like that show up. Every so how can single you, time. How can you potentially even close a park with, with the outcry? 
Well, I think they're absolutely right. Uh, we'll have hundreds of people at every thousand, every park that we intend to close. Our goal is is to keep the parks open as much as we can, which will mean shorter service time and, and shorter hours. And so we're going to have to use less people there. It's, it will service will different look different than what it does today. And uh, one more uh, Facebook question here before we move on to the phone calls. Nancy, who must live up in this area, said, I would like to know, since the board has known for months or at least a year that there were financial problems that could get worse, why they didn't share this with the communities that were impacted the most sooner so they could have worked on solutions. They gave Clearwater County less than three weeks to come up with $147,000, and all the while we're meeting with the Corps to close the park. Well, that, that's really not quite how that happened. In fact, the, when we, uh, I came on board in, in the end of September, the board had just barely made that decision, and it was all predicated on holdbacks. So within two weeks after we heard that that may indeed happen, we went immediately up to Clearwater County to meet with the people in the, in the Corps of Engineers as well as the county. And very briefly, the Corps of Engineers actually owns Store Shack. So we saw the footage right. of the dam. Uh, why can they, they not pay for the state or the county to maintain it? Well, that, that was a plan. In fact, that was the whole reason why Dorshack was selected was because we thought we had a partner with Dorshack and they, the park would remain open. That was the whole plan. If we turned our management back to the people that owned it, that they could take up, step up to the plate and keep the parks open and, and there would not be any impact uh, that would happen. Unfortunately, uh, the core does not have the ability to do that. They don't have the authorization to cost share like the Bureau of Reclamation or the Fish and Game or some of these others. They're working on that, and I think that the day will come soon that they will have that ability to, in which time we'll do it. legislation through Congress to change it will. that. Okay. Let's take a phone call. <laughs> Jeff in Idaho Falls. Jeff, go ahead, please. Yes. Have you looked at raising revenue by joining up with, like, public television <laughs> and doing special TV series about the state parks? and perhaps putting together calendars and different things that could be sold. Thank you very much for your call, Jeff. And no, I did not plant that question. <laughs> uh, uh, I assume the dollars that you're looking for are just so great. that It sounds like a great idea. And you're getting a, a lot idea. of great ideas from your staff, but you're looking for big, big dollars. We you? are. We will need a little more than that. And I don't think even putting uh, public television and parks together, we could <laughs> together would, could find coming up with enough money to do that. However, uh, every kind of advertising in, uh, will help. Okay, let's take a call from Mark in Boise. Mark, go ahead, please. Hello. Hi, go ahead. I'd like to ask your guest, um, in my mind, uh, judging from articles in the paper, that this is really a game of politics, not a game of cost-cutting measures with the parks, that the, politi uh, the political game is between you, the board of directors, and the governor like to know your comments about the power pull between the three parties involved. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, um, I, I don't believe it's a, a political thing. I think it's a reality. Um, we found out about the plan to fold the parks into uh, the Idaho Department of Lands and with registration going to Fish and Game. The board had already made the decision for Dwarshack and to also look at some other parks closures based upon holdbacks that were coming down the line. And so there was a contingency plan based upon that. Um, our so your selection, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> there had been rumors that your selection as director somehow, uh, by the board, by the way, the board picks The you, board picks me. Uh, that, that somehow miffed somebody higher up and that they're, you know, that, that this well, is... Well, I really I mean, can't, <laughs> yeah, I really can't, you know, talk to anybody else about that, but I would say that we have a good relationship and that... Uh, in working with the governor's office, uh, they did allow us to come up with an alternative plan, and uh, which was, I thought, <laughs> after there was an outcry, kind uh, of about the well, potential. yeah, yes, after there was an outcry, and after we said, let us please come up with an alternative plan, which they did, and so we went to work to try to still meet the governor's goals, which was to keep money in in schools and reduce us from the general fund and try to find a way to do that, and so this is how we did it. So to answer his question, do you feel like you have a good relationship with the governor's office? Yes, I do. And do you feel like you have a good relationship with the board that hired you? I do. I think that we're all trying to work together in, in coming to a, a solution that's difficult for all of them. And everybody's coming from it from a different angle, but I think the goal is to keep parks open. There is a proposed legislation from Senator Schroeder uh, from Moscow, uh, which is, t is in his desk right now, but somehow is tied to the anger over Dorshak, which would have your position be appointed by the governor instead of the parks board. And uh, 
somebody wrote in and asked, uh, wouldn't this make that your job, the director, just simply a political appointment and be in direct conflict with the intent of having an independent professional parks department potentially even violate the terms of the lease with Harriman? Well, I think that that was some of the concern that was out there, and it depends on how you read the agreement and on how it's interpreted. But indeed, that was some of the concern, I believe, that came through. Do you believe that your position should be appointed by the governor or by the Parks Board? Well, you know, I was hired by my board, so it would be hard for me to say that I would believe that I should be appointed by the governor right now. I'm working for my board, and, and I'm pleased with doing so. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about the sad issue of laying people off. Twenty-five, 25. estimated. Of course, some of those positions are, are vacant right now. And um, additional ones would not be filled. Now, uh, these positions would go away. And um, there's some concern that, you know, if you want to be an agency that's increasing revenue, that you need the ability to fill those positions quickly and kind of keep them on the books. Uh, that would be that would be the perfect scenario. We'd, we would love to be able to do is keep some of those full-time positions vacant, but uh, allow them to be able to be filled as needed. Um, most of our jobs are very specialized, and we have one or two people in those positions that uh, in which they do. We have two agencies, basically divisions within our mm -hmm. department, and so we have the recreation department and we have the parks department, and so it takes a good support group to run all of that. And so uh, when you take one or two out of a department that's very small or division that's very small, it's going to shuffle that workload quite a bit. And uh, it's very difficult when you have to let people go or lay them off in this any kind but, and to think about them uh, not being there and being able to help support this team. One thing you did get, or it sounds like you're going to get, is, and we won't go into the details, but it's kind of lump sum authorization, authorization. which is kind of yeah. geeky. But it basically means that you'd be able to, sp if this happens, you'd be able to spend your money when you needed to spend it instead of like a govern other government agencies having to kind of wait for certain things to be authorized. Yeah, and that's a pretty big deal. It is a huge big deal. And uh, we're in this transition period of uh, where we really have had a great reduction, not only from the holdbacks, but from this... Uh, weaning us off a of general fund. So trying to make everything fit and pay all the bills and put people where they need to go and and buy the products they need to be bought, need to have, we don't know how that's all going to fit. So having this lump sum authorization is going to allow us to move within our box. We still have the, the strings attached, but we have to move within those areas. Okay, let's try and take another call and we'll go to Jim in Twin Falls. Jim, go ahead, please. Hi, thank you. I was wondering if the uh, annual pass uh, fees would help increase the amount of money that the state of Idaho has. Mm -hmm. I think very few people realize how easy it is to get an annual pass and how inexpensive it is. Thank you very much for your call. Annual passes are going to go up. That is one way you're going to increase revenue. Annual passes will go up by five dollars. They'll still be a great deal. And you're right. To forty dollars. To forty dollars. Right? Uh, they are a really great deal. And peop more people, we need to let make aware more people that uh, we have those. Somebody else wrote in and said, "Wouldn't it make more sense to charge a higher higher user fees to non-residents, similar to the way we do for hunting and fishing licenses?" You know, there's a uh, there's that concern, and and uh, we get that a lot up in northern Idaho, particularly where we have nearly. Yes, actually, I say whenever I visit Priest Lake and yeah. Farragut, I notice that around 80 to 90 percent of the vehicles are from Washington State. And and we do have a lot of people from out of state using those parks up in northern Idaho, but there is a federal law prohibiting that because those funds were those parks were built with land water conservation funds so they're not allowed to do that we're working on some ideas that, that would allow them to uh, be able to maybe uh, register a little sooner or reserve a little sooner if you can with that and also if we were able to move to a registration fee instead of our instead of our annual passes like which we have then then we could actually charge the out-of-staters a little more for coming into our parks okay let's take another call and I saw, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name incorrectly, Lejeune in Nampa, is that correct? Yes, thank okay. you very please, much. Please go I, ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I think I'd like to ask why we can't use volunteers to man the parks, because we have so many uh, unemployed people that if we had a core of volunteers, that would be helpful. Okay, thank you very much. I know a large part of your plan is predicated on the use of more volunteers, and I also know from listening to JFAC that there's concern about that. 
and frankly from I think one of your board members that it's a good thing but you know may may not fill all the gaps well it certainly won't fill all the gaps but it'll fill many of the gaps and the main thing that we have to have is make sure that we have a professional people in the park to take care of the professional needs but the volunteers are very important to us and Lajeen we'd like to have your name and number <laughs> well you said yeah. that you had a volunteer group just today saying we they'd do. go mow the lawn at Thousand Springs actually I did and that was a, a really fun thing we have down at Thousand Springs we have the um, a motorcycle, motorcycle group. group that comes down there every year Brother Speed and uh, one of the things that they have said is we'll come mow the lawn and uh, we have a lot of people like that with volunteers trying to do that. We're looking at pictures of Thousand Springs uh, there that's a uh, you've worked with the Nature Conservancy yes. to get that uh, precious land. Will this park stay open um, and if so would it only be one employee? And would that meet the terms of the agreement? You know, I think it's interesting, Marcia. Our parks are so different throughout all of Idaho, whether you go up to Priest Lake or Farragut or the beautiful lakes up there, or to the Brunel Sand Dunes or over to Hiram, and every one of them is different. But the, in the Thousand Springs area, which you see there on the screen, um, we are, there are seven different units or different, different, completely different little pieces of land that are part of the whole of the park. And so a Ritter Island is part of a conservancy fund, and Box Canyon was built with mm -hmm. special Hardy. funds. Right. Yeah. And so every one of them has some special little strings attached. Right now we're talking one, one caretaker. Wow. And uh, very, very quickly you mentioned Bruno. Uh, somebody wrote in and wanted to know, why is the observatory at Bruno being cut to just one night a month when this is one of the few money-generating attractions in the entire park system? I think it boils down to staff and uh, trying to get some more people there if we can bring in some seasonal and some volunteers and staff it, it's just it's just boils down to staff ultimately do you think at the end of this fiscal year for people watching that we will see uh, any parks close our goal is not to close a single park and that's what the governors ask us to do and that is what our board has asked us to do uh, and that's what we're certainly going to try to do the, our very best, and that is really what we're going to try to work for. It will re, it will result in reduction of services and the amount of length of time that those parks are open, and how many people are there to staff them. You just have so many dollars that you can only sp spread so thin, and so uh, those that's what we will have to do. But the goal really is to try to keep all of our parks open. We realize the economic impact that it has on every one of our communities. The parks are actually put money back into the general fund and into the state because every person that goes to a park usually stops, will buy something at a grocery store, a cup of coffee. Uh, they'll buy something for their snowmobiles or their ATVs as they go onto the trails. And all of those dollars go into the community, into the stores, and then sales tax and back into the state. That helps fund schools. It helps with the health and welfare and other departments that are in need. And so when we cut parks out of, out of a community, we are cutting the economic engine that helps fuel the state. Well, I know that uh, you've had a steep learning curve. Yes, I have. <laughs> uh, to, to get to this point, you've only been on jobs a couple of months. We will continue to follow this issue, uh, certainly on our Idaho Reports, our legislative program, and hope to have you back on, uh, on dialogue as well to see how things are going. You've been listening to Director Nancy Merrill of the Idaho Department's Department of Parks and Recreation. This is Dialogue. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you'll join us same time next week. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. To order a copy of this program from Idaho Public Television, call our toll-free number or visit us on the World Wide Web.